All right, F Sharp, welcome back. We are continuing our journey of writing a ridiculously fast dictionary using only F Sharp. Now, last time when we left off, we were starting to trade blows with the .NET dictionary. And I've said it before, I'll repeat it. The .NET dictionary is a fantastic dictionary. It is a great default. This is not meant to be disparaging to that dictionary in any way. Anyway, I just, I, I like the challenge and I wanted a better read-only dictionary. So I was like, how far down can I go? And I was inspired by the C++ talk. So here we are. So we were trading blows. And what we saw is that by integrating the, some of the ideas from the .NET dictionary, specifically, hey, if we have a key that is a reference type, we are going to keep a comparer around in the instance of our dictionary. And we are also going to have a specialization if the key is a string. Now, when we did that, we were able to start matching or beating the performance of the .NET dictionary when our key is a string. What we saw, though, is a degradation in the performance of the, our dictionary when the key is an integer. That's not great. Uh, what's going on? Well, what I, where I went from here is I went and looked at the .NET dictionary some more and drew some inspiration from it. So I'm going to kind of walk you through it. And then we're going to dive deeper into it. So I have gone to it's the same place I was last time. So I've, I've gone to source dot 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 net and looked up system dot collections dot generic dot dictionary. And I went down to find value. And we talked through this a little bit last time. But there's a really interesting note here that I wanted to emphasize. And it, it kind of kind of got blocked last time because I was scrolled all the way to the left. But this comment keeps going over to the right. And it's this one here. And it says, enable JIT to eliminate, I'm looking at this line here, enable JIT to eliminate entire if block for ref types. Now this is interesting. So this gives you a hint as to what the CLR is capable of. So what's happening here is that there's a check here on the key type. And it says, if that the type of the key is a value type, then you can skip this if block. And what the CLR can do when it's actually compiling the dictionary, like your instance of the dictionary, you can say like, oh, well, if the key type for this dictionary is a reference type, I can just delete this block. Like I can just delete this if statement because it'll never happen because the key is a reference type. So the, the, team person who wrote this is taking advantage of that saying like, Hey, I can, the CLR is very smart. And this kind of gets the idea of, of meta programming a little bit. We can do some light meta programming in .NET where the runtime does have an awareness of the difference between value types and reference types, and will conditionally compile code based on that information. Now, this inspired me to say like, hey, I wrote code that looks a lot like this in F sharp. So shouldn't I be getting that same behavior? Say like, hey, well, my get value function is also, it has an if statement based on like, hey, if the key is a value type, I'm gonna run this code. But if it's not a value type, it's gonna run this code. So I should be getting a benefit there, right? Well, I am, if you remember, our string keys are performing better now, but our, uh, our integer is worse. What could be happening? Well, I hope you like assembly <laughs> because we're about to go read some assembly and figure out what the heck is going on. So one of the fantastic features of benchmark.net no, I don't, I don't want to move that file. Please do not do that. One of the fantastic features is that you, ba -ba -bum. so I, I guess we're getting this for free. 
because it's already printing out. Oh, I've probably used it previously. But let me see a place where I've actually used it. Ah, disassembly diagnoser. So I have run those other benchmarks previously with this attribute on them. But what this does is it tells the benchmark.net like, hey, I want you to print out the assembly that was generated when running these benchmarks. Like I said, I've done that historically, even though you don't see it on my benchmark right now, I have done it in the past and that file is still around. So we can go and look at it because uh, that's what I was examining to get this next insight. And so I realized this is small. Uh, there's a lot of data here, so it's just going to be a challenge. So if you please be patient with me, I am looking for Fibonacci hashing assembly. Okay. What is going on here? We are looking at the beauty of x86 assembly now. And so this is one of the files that gets printed out from benchmark.net. If you wanted to see where it is, uh, I will go ahead and show you. Let me bring over the directory. So this is the directory that has the fast dictionary test.benchmark project in it. And benchmark.net produces this benchmark.net dot artifacts directory, which is where all this information is being stored about our benchmark results. Oh goodness, I gotta clean this out. I have a huge amount of data here. <laughs> and if you go into the results directory, that's where all these reports are. So I have opened up this directory using VS Code so I can more easily navigate to them and look at them. So we are looking at the assembly for the Fibonacci hashing benchmark. So that's two videos ago. And the performance of looking up ints was better in the Fibonacci hashing benchmark than it is in our cache equality benchmark. So we want to see like, hey, what changed between these? So I'm now looking at the code. Da, da, da. So I'm now looking at the benchmark code and the assembly that is generated. And the key thing here is like, okay, system collections, generic dictionary. So this is a lookup. So this is calling the method to get an item from the .NET dictionary. Okay. So this is important. Notice that when we are looking up a value from the .NET dictionary, it is directly calling the find value method. That And so this is going to be a new stack frame for us when we call this method. Okay. Now, da, 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 I want to look for our benchmark. Uh, nope, still not ours. I'll find it. Yeah. Okay. Find value? Nope. My apologies. Okay, where are you? Uh, nope. Ours. Okay, here, okay, here I believe, yeah, this is ours. So this is our Fibonacci hashing. And in here we see, okay, so this is our Fibonacci hashing dictionary. This is two videos ago, the fast one, the fast for end. And what we see is when this benchmark is running, it's doing these move stores, comparisons, and then when it gets into the loop, it's saying, oh, okay, I need to find a value and it calls our loop function here. Now let's look at the benchmark in writer. I'm going to go look at Fibonacci hashing. I'm going to scroll to the bottom. Okay. This is the methods getting called to get an item. It calls the get value function. This is the get value function. Okay. What we're seeing, and I'm now going to, so that this is the dictionary, our custom dictionary for looking up values. And now I'm going to go to the benchmark. And so that assembly we just looked at is for this benchmark here. And so this is where it is looking up values. This call right here is saying like, hey, on this dictionary, I want you to look up a value. The key is an integer. Here's what's important though. This method call, because that's really what's going on. This is just syntactic search, syntactic 
sugar for this method call. This method call is calling the get value function. Inside the get value function is our loop recursive function for going down the list and getting the value. Okay, notice benchmark calls the item method, which calls the get value function, which then calls this recursive loop. What you will notice in our benchmark though, you don't see those other method calls. All you see is this call to this recursive loop down here. You don't see the get item method call. You don't see the get value function call. All you see is this. So this is inlining several layers of method call. I'm going to switch back. What is happening is this get value function is getting inlined into this method call here. And then this method call is getting inlined into this benchmark, this method here. So there's like an inlining and then another inlining that's happening. This is important. Notice this is the same behavior that the .NET dictionary had. If we look at the behavior in cache equality, sorry, this is, that's the benchmark. This is our cache equality. This is our cache equality dictionary. This is our latest better string performance, worse integer performance. We would hope that we would get that same like inlining within inlining. Let's check the assembly to see if we actually are getting that kind of double, double inlining. And I need to go find the result for that. Okay. Where are you? Cache equality assembly markdown. This is, this is the assembly for our dictionary for cache equality one. And we scroll down and we see this call to get value. Notice this isn't the loop call. This is calling, I'm going to switch back. This is calling this function. So this get value function is not being inlined into here like it was in the Fibonacci hashing version of our dictionary. So we now have this call to get value. And let's see if uh, I'm going to just go ahead and find get value. See, and now here's the assembly for the get value method. And so what's happening is we now have an extra frame. We have an extra stack frame for this method calls and see here's, here's our loop function now. So before this was all getting inlined, like this double level inlining, we're not getting that anymore. So our performance for the integer lookup, and I'm going to pull it back up. Our performance for the integer lookup has gotten worse. Why has it gotten worse? It has an additional stack frame <laughs> in this method call. And that is what is slowing us down now. How do we get rid of that additional stack frame? That is a good question. So I'm going to switch. So here's, I, I made a, a slight mental leap and I'm going to walk you through the reasoning. So what I did is I looked at, um, I knew, I knew the, behavior of the CLR based on the source code for the .NET dictionary. It's like, okay, the CLR will delete code that it knows it doesn't need when it's doing these type checks, these kind of switching, like, is it a value type? Is it a reference type? And it will delete code. And when I was looking at this and I'm in cache equality right now, and I look at get value and I'm saying, Hey, it may be having a tough time figuring this out. And because of that, it sees a really large function 
and it doesn't want to inline that function. And I'll probably do another video some other time talking about like, you know, the reason behind like how the CLR likely reasons about when it should or should not inline method calls. And so what I'm wanting to do is lift that check closer to basically the call site. And what I mean by that is like, okay, in this get call, so this is the method call that's kind of like, you could think of it as like being at the very boundary of our dictionary. Like this is the method that's actually being called when we do that square brackets. I'm going to put the type check here. I'm going to say like, hey, if the key type is a value type, call this function. Else call the get ref value. So if it's a value type, it's going to call the get struct value function. And if it's a ref type, and it's not a value type, it's a ref type. And so it's going to say call this get ref value function. And so inside of these functions, there's no additional checks for the type. It already knows if it's a struct or it's a ref. And so it has the appropriate logic there. And so what my reasoning was is like, well, these are both smaller functions now. They're about half the size because the check has been lifted into the calling function. So my reasoning was like, this is probably going to be easier for the CLR to reason about and therefore be able to inline. And so when I benchmark that, I get my speed back. <laughs> Integer keys are now fast again. They are now faster than the .NET dictionary. And I've gotten actually much better performance from string lookups as well. And again, this is, this is fantastic. This is what I was looking for. So like, okay, I got my integer lookup speed back. I got my, I have, I have even better string lookup performance. Okay. You know, what exactly is giving us this? And I said like, Hey, you know, we, we're wanting to eliminate that stack frame so that we get that better inlining behavior. So, you know, let's actually verify that that is what is happening. So again, we're going to look at the assembly to see like what is actually happening at the end of the day. And that is the fast type branch. Let's look at this sweet, sweet assembly. Oh, no, come back here. Fast type branch assembly. Sweet, 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 sweet. So again, okay, fast dictionary test benchmark. And we'll see, are we getting what we expect? This is the benchmark starting from running. We come down here and we see Bum, bum, bum. Call the loop. This is that call to the inner recursive loop function. So this is the same thing we saw with the Fibonacci hashing. We have the, the functions being inlined and then that functions also being inlined. So we're getting that double level of inlining. Now we don't have that additional stack frame. So this is fantastic. We're back to where I, we were with the Fibonacci hashing and integers, but now we have it for integers and for strings. This is great. And as you can see at the end of the day, it's just like, hey man, at, at these levels, stack frames matter. <laughs> um, and that's, that's how hard we're needing to push it. And this is where having, sometimes having simpler code is really advantageous because it allows the CLR and also the CPU to better reason about it and make guesses about what it is that you're trying to do, make sure that the appropriate data is in memory and predict the right branches. So I know that was a bit deep, uh, but it was a really critical piece for us to address going forward because that additional stack frame was just going to haunt us. <laughs> and so with this additional inlining, we've uh, opened ourselves up to additional optimizations that are very exciting. So I hope you found this interesting. I'm having a ball. Uh, please leave a comment. If you have questions, if you want me to go deeper into some particular thing, uh, I want to know what it is that you want me to dive into. If there was anything that was unclear, let me know. Uh, but until next time, thank you so much for spending some time with me. It's really been a pleasure. Have a good day.